wasting this time and make sure it's going good. I think you're lying. Good evening, everyone. What a blessing these evening and morning devotionals have been. Everyone shares just a little different perspective on living life with Jesus and relating to all the changing times that we're living in right now. And it's all been so valuable. Thank you, Greater Milwaukee Adventist Pastors, for taking the time and effort to, to provide this whole Facebook venue. It's been wonderful. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Juanita Edge. I serve as the communication director for the Wisconsin Conference, and I enjoy passing on the stories of what God is doing in people's lives and sharing events that um, are happening around the conference. I'm married to Mike Edge, and we have two wonderful grown children, and we have three precious I, I grandchildren. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Yes. Lord in heaven, send your Holy Spirit to be with us as we um, open your word tonight. Thank you for your promise to be with us. I pray these things in your name. Amen. The Bible text I want us to consider this evening is found in Luke 8, 39. And Jesus has just cast out demons from a madman along the oh. shores of Galilee. The man is so happy and thankful, he just begs Jesus, please take me with you, let me go with you. But Jesus says to him in um, Luke okay, sorry about that. 8, 39, okay. return to your house and tell what great things God has done for you. This man was to return to his own home and testify of what God had done for him. I believe Jesus said this because there are people, were people in this man's home, church, and community who may would never believe that Jesus, what Jesus, a stranger, said. After all, he had just ruined their economy, having all these pigs run into the river and um, into the lake, and they wanted him to just leave. They wanted nothing to do with him. Um, yet seeing and hearing a personal testimony from someone they knew well they could be brought back to a place of learning, acceptance, and ultimately salvation in Jesus. So him going home and telling what God did for him was really, really important. Jesus needed him to do that. And so I'm going to share a little story that um, has meant a lot to me that's been passed on in our family. And I want you to think about stories in your family that um, you might could pass on because I think our stories are needed. I think God needs us to tell our stories and to write our stories so that they can make a difference in other people's lives. As far back as I can remember, my family made regular trips down to Arkansas to visit Grandma and Grandpa. While there, we got to help feed Grandpa's baby calves from a big baby bottle, and I got to go swimming in the creek nearby and find fossil rocks. I made discoveries of long-lost items in the attic of their chicken house, and I love to swing in the huge vines hanging from the oak trees. I remember on the coffee table in the living room, Grandma had a little glass box where she kept all her family photos. Most of the pictures were dull black and white with a few water spots on them. But what made those faded pictures in that little glass box so intriguing to me were the stories that my grandmother would tell about them. And one of the stories came from this picture right here, which I hope you can see. There's my grandma and grandpa, and um, their three children. And um, the tallest girl there, that's Alice. The boy in the middle is my dad, Richard. And then that small boy was Melvin, their little brother. And I like to call this story um, Grandma and the Two Angels. When Grandma and Grandpa first got married, in Oklahoma, they began life in a little house where they're in a community where there were not very many Seventh-day Adventist Christians. 
Grandma and Grandpa loved Jesus, though, and they loved the Bible very much. They read and studied it regularly, and they prayed that God would help them to know um, the best way to share Jesus with their neighbors. Grandma especially wanted to share Jesus with one of her neighbors named Marge and was praying for some idea of a way of, or some way to reach her and what to say to her. So one night, several hours after Grandma and Grandpa had gone to bed, Grandma just couldn't fall asleep. So she lay there in bed. As she, as she lay there in bed, she began to pray for her neighbor, Marge, as she had done many times before. Suddenly, she saw a bright and shining angel standing in the doorway. She was so surprised, and she said that the light lit up the whole room, but it didn't wake up Grandpa. The smiling, beautiful angel was holding a Bible like this, and she said, and the angel said, give Marge a Bible. Then, as suddenly as the angel had appeared, the angel disappeared, leaving, leaving Grandma more wide awake now than she was before. She pinched herself to make sure she was really awake. She woke Grandpa up and excitedly told him what had just happened, but he was very sleepy. And she said, he said she must be dreaming and rolled over and went back to sleep. She was not dreaming. She was very much awake and she thanked God. Like, in Dave, like David in Psalm 66, 19, she said, certainly God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. The next morning, Grandma found an extra Bible, said a prayer of thanksgiving, and confidently walked over to Marge's house. Marge was happy to see Grandma, and even more delighted when Grandma handed her a Bible, saying, do you have a Bible? She said, I have an extra one, and I thought maybe you would like one, too. Well, Marge grinned from ear to ear, Grandma said, and she held that Bible close to her chest, saying, oh, thank you, thank you. I've never had a Bible before. I'm so excited. I've always wanted one. Soon after this, Grandma and Grandpa had to move to Missouri, and they started a farm. And while, while they were there, they had three little children, the three I showed you earlier in the picture. Well, one day, Alice, Richard, and Melvin, ages three, five, and six, just like I showed you in the picture, Grandpa said to them, come on, kids, <clears throat> let's go out and gather hay in from the field today. Well, they loved riding in the hay wagon because they Grandpa would pile the hay high up on the wagon. I have a picture of this, but I couldn't find it. But I did find this picture, and this picture has um, Grandpa. It's not on the wagon, but they have the hay that they piled up once they got back to the house. And before they put all those boards there, the kids would slide down that and have a delightful time. And right here, we just have um, Melvin and Richard, but Alice would slide on that too. Well, that day they had a delightful time sliding. It was a wonderful day. But that evening, three-year-old Melvin started getting sick and grandma and grandpa noticed that he had an awful spider bite. In fact, they soon learned that he had been bitten by a black widow spider. They took him to the doctor, but nothing the doctor did was able to help Melvin get better. Within a few days, their precious little Melvin died. Grandma was heartbroken. Oh, how she missed the pitter-patter of little Melvin's feet running across the floor, and oh, how she missed holding him close to her. But Melvin was gone. Grandpa built a crude little wooden box, and they all went out and buried him in the corner of their hayfield. During the weeks after Melvin's death, Grandma would lie awake at night, mulling over sweet memories of Melvin, and I'm sure she cried a few tears during those hours, too. And it was on one night like this, when Grandma couldn't sleep, that suddenly the room was filled with light, and standing in her doorway was the same beautiful angel who had encouraged her to share a Bible with Marge. She instantly sat up in bed, but this time, instead of holding a Bible, the angel was holding her little Melvin. With joy in his face, Melvin stretched out his arms, crying, Mommy, Mommy. Now, if Grandma hadn't studied her Bible every day to know what God said, she might have jumped up and hugged her little Melvin, but she didn't. Grandma said, instantly, in the time it takes you to blink your eye, Bible verses flashed through her, through her mind, Exodus 9, 5, and 6, and Texas said, the dead are asleep. 
in the ground until Jesus comes and that they don't know anything. And immediately grandma said, within a blink of an eye, I knew what I needed to do. So she said, I quickly closed my eyes and I said, Jesus, if this isn't from you, please take it away because everything in me wants to take my middle Melvin. And she said, just as suddenly as um, the angel had appeared, it dis angel disappeared. And along with it, the bright shining light and little Melvin all disappeared. Grandma could feel her heart beating wildly. She took a deep breath and laid back down in the bed. Melvin had died, and although she missed him, she knew and believed the Bible promised that someday Jesus would come and Melvin would be raised to life and they would be together and they would never experience death again. But right now, she knew that couldn't be. Grandma told me that both angels that appeared to her were identical. They looked identical, they sounded identical, except that the message of the angel with Melvin didn't agree with the, what the Bible teaches. By sharing this story of faith with me many times while I was growing up, Grandma was leaving me a legacy, uh, I'd say a twofold legacy, but actually it's probably bigger than that. And it's um, a legacy that's endured the test of time because the story has stayed with me. The impacting legacy I got, one, the two impacting legacies I got from this story are number one, I must read and study my Bible to know Jesus and know truth. It's very important that I know and I understand what it teaches or I could easily be deceived. And the second impacting legacy this story left with me is if something I learned or experienced does not agree with the Bible, don't believe it. No matter how convincing what I see, what I hear, and what I feel may seem, don't believe it. In our story, in our Bible verse in Luke 8:39 earlier, we read, return to your house and tell what great things God has done for you. Telling stories is a memorable way to communicate. Story, they keep the stories alive and it can bring benefit and insight to the listeners. Stories are what we call sticky. And that means they stick in your mind and they can last a lifetime. Our faith stories can be held in the hearts of our children and our grandchildren, our friends and our neighbors long after we are gone. And the unthinkable reality is that we don't really like to think about that some of us may not be around when this coronavirus fades away. But our shared stories of God's goodness, his providence, and answers to prayer can survive way beyond us, even to future generations who have never even met us. This, there's an amazing statement in Psalm 78 that I want to read to you real quick here, starting in verse 2. And listen to these words. I think it's just so amazing. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter that which has been heard and known and our fathers and our fathers have told us we will not hide these from our children telling them to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and of his wonderful works which he has done for he established a testimony in Jerusalem and he appointed a law in Israel which he commanded to our fathers that they should make known to their children that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they would arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. When I sat down and looked at that verse, it's like at least four generations and maybe five that it is mentioned that we are to share. And I know years ago, we had much more of a verbal um, passing on society, and now we have the written word. But I just think passing on what God is doing in our lives is so, so very important. If we don't share our faith stories um, where we've proved God and we found him faithful, we're depriving ourselves and maybe several generations of the blessings of God's faithfulness. You and I do have a testimony. You have lived a life filled with God's in interventions. 
Have you taken the time to share it with your family and with your grandchildren and with your neighbors? You know, even being vulnerable and telling the next generation about some of our mistakes that we've made and how they've impacted our lives, they can help others grow. They can grow in discernment and realize the impact of making good or bad choices. Not only can we share our stories verbally, but we can write them down. We can write the stories of God's goodness so that you can potentially, they can more potentially last for generations to come. You know, most of us are in our own houses for a while. Let's leave legacies of faith. Let's start telling stories of God's blessings and answers to prayer. Are you at home alone? You can take the time to write down those precious stories and put them with a picture maybe to make it even uh, more of a reality and send them to people. A lot of people could use your encouragement right now and it may be just the thing they need to grow stronger in their faith. Let's pray. Thank you, dear Jesus, for all you have done in our lives. You've been so abundantly gracious and good to all of us. Help us to always be ready to lift up your name and to share your one, the wondrous things that you have done in our lives to whoever you place in our path. Pray these things in your name. Amen. God's blessings to you all. Have a good rest of your evening.